So it's my pleasure to uh, uh, to present today uh, Jean Azevedo from uh, University of Brasilia, who is going uh, to speak about findings of some verbal subgroups in profinite groups. Please. Thank you, Professor Zaleski, and thank you all for attending to this talk. Um, as Professor Zaleski said, I'm going to talk about finiteness of some verbal subgroups in profinite groups. And this is a joint work with Professor Pavel Shumiatsky. Okay, so let's give some definitions before we start. Um, we'll say that a group word is simply an element of the free ordinary group on free generators x1 to xk. And usually a group word is also seen regarded as a function um, with domain being the direct product of k copies of g and having codomain as g itself. And we usually denote by gw its image. Um, we call this the set of w values of the word in g. And this can also be defined as, well, being the set of elements of G that can be recovered when you replace the variables X1, XK by arbitrary elements G1, GK belonging to G. Obviously, we're interested in the subgroup generated by this set. So we call the subgroup generated by it the verbal subgroup associated to the word W. And in case G is profinite, as it's the case here in this talk, we're going to consider W of G to be the closed subgroup generated by GW. So I will not write down um, bars about things to denote closures, okay? We are going to talk about closed subgroups only. Um, and finally, we say that a word W is concise in a class C of groups if for all members of the class having finite set of W values, then the verbal subgroup generated by them uh, is finite, okay? Um, so going on, we also say that W is a multilinear commutator word if W can be obtained by nesting commutators, but always with different variables. For example, this first guy here is a multilinear commutator. See, the variables do not repeat, while the second guy, the angle commutator, is not, since we have repetitions in the Y variable, okay? Um, so we're talking about conciseness of words. Um, in the 60s, Philip Hall conjectured that all words would be concise. And this conjecture was later famously actually refuted by Sergei Ivanov in 1989, where Ivanov constructed a group where this word that you can see here admits only one non-trivial value um, of infinite order. But here, of course, we have to choose suitably P and N. P is a very large prime and N is a very large integer. So things happen. Um, those examples come from can be actually derived from geometric group theory. Um, Oshansky also gave other examples using geometric group theory of words that are not concise, okay? But before the 60s, there were people working with related problems. For example, we have a, a very well-known result by Sai Shuch, um, where he proves that when a group has finitely many commutators, then the derived subgroup is um, finite. Right. Actually, his statement was, when a group has at the when a group has its center having finite index, but that's um, but that's the same thing. Okay. But we also have several examples of well-behaved words that are actually concise. For instance, Jeremy Wilson proved in '74 that all multilinear commutators, as we defined it before, are concise. More recently, Fernandez Alcobe, Morig, and Traustason proved that the words of the form X and Y are concise, where this notation um, denotes words with repetition of the second variable like this. So this should be written X three Y, okay? The, the nth angle word, but they are concise only for N at mo being at most four, up to four. And last year, me and Professor Shumiatsky proved that words having the form U1, U2, and U3, where the three words does not belong to the derived, do not belong to the derived subgroup of F, where F is a free group, those are also concise. And as examples of classes of groups admitting um, good behaviors with respect to conciseness, we have those two well-known results, one due to Yuri Maslyakov from 1967, where he proved that all words are concise in the class of linear groups. And also Keith Jordan, 76, this um, other guy was a student from, of Philip Hall. 
he proved that all words are concise in the class of virtually nilpotent by abelian groups. And here, by nilpotent by abelian, I, I say a group admitting a, an abelian normal group, subgroup, such that the quotient over it is nilpotent. Uh, so conciseness in general, conciseness in classes of groups, but more recently, Andrei Haikin Sapirain and independently Dan Siegel, they asked um, whether every word should be concise in the class of residually finite groups. And I have some reason to believe on, on, this, uh, on this thing, since there are several examples of words known to be concise in the class of residually finite groups, but not known yet to be concise in the class of all groups. For example, Acharya and Shumyatsky proved that W2Q is a word concise in the class of residually finite groups whenever W is a multilinear commutative word and Q is a prime power. And more recently, the Tami Morigi and Shumyatsky proved that the angle commutate or W2Q and several copies of Y. This guy is also concise in the class of residually finite groups, but once again, Q here is a prime power. Um, they also proved that words having those two shapes, so V and Y, here we repeat the independent variable Y, and also at Y and V, we repeat the word V, um, where V equals um, some prime power of the lower central commutator X1, XK, those are also concise. And recently, me and Professor Shumiansky proved that, oh, I'm sorry, this is unspring. This should be 2020, not 2021. We proved that words having the form um, U1, U2, UN, where all of those U's do not belong to the derived subgroup of the free group, they are also concise. Um, well, let me, let me also say another thing about those results. When we, when we talk about conciseness of words, one might ask, um, so is there a way to, to propose new problems, I mean, to propose new words that are possible and plausible to be concise, but starting from old, no, old words that you already know that are concise? And one might say, well, let's consider powers of those words, or, or let's consider commutators of those words. And the truth is, well, Yes, in some, case, in some cases, we can actually prove that powers or commutators are um, concise, right? And there is a, also a third way of extending, um, of constructing, cooking up the words that, that are plausible to be concise, um, beginning with a word that you already know that that is. The third way should be this way. Considering angle, angle words involving a well-behaved word here on the first entry or being repeated on the, the other entries. Those are also ways that we explored um, to study other cases of words that, uh, that um, should be, be concise. Okay, so let's keep going. So another definition, uh, consider G to be a group, W to be any group word, and take A, um, an element from the set of W values of G. We are going to say that the word W is weakly rational if for every integer E co-prime to the order of the element A, A to the E is again an A W value. Um, it's a well-known thing that the usual commutator X comma Y is a weakly rational word. It's a common exercise when people study character theory of finite groups. And in a collaboration between Granik and Shmiatsky, they proved that words having this form are weakly rational. So extensions of powers by um, independent variable via commutators, and then you put powers outside, and then you extend by another independent variable and powers outside. And they did it in the same paper that they proved that all weakly rational words are concise in the class of residual finite groups. And obviously, um, to speak about weakly rationality, we must have um, some notion of order, or at least some nice generalization of it. Um, to speak about weakly rational words in, in the, the sense of infinite groups, but in profinite groups, we can, we can do so. Um, um, Gronk and Shmiatsky, for example, we studied weakly rational words looking to the finite quotients of groups, right? And in our case, we'll do sort of the same thing. So if W is any rational, weakly rational word, and G is a profinite group, 
Um, if you suppose that A is a W value in G, and if I is any topological generator of Z hat, the profile completion of, of the integers, then the power A to the I will be again a W value. This result is obtained by generalizing the idea of, well, co-prime exponent that I set up here to the idea that, uh, of um, a word is weakly rational when all generators of the cyclic subgroup, the W value uh, of the cyclic subgroup, a W value generate, generates are again W values. And so the profinite analog, analog of this thing should be considering elements that are able to generate the, the same procyclic subgroup that A generates, right? And that's why we take Y to be topological generators of Z hat. So we have this notion of profinite groups. Very good. Um, and to keep going. So let's talk about how this problem evolved um, to the class of profinite groups. So in a paper from 2015, the Tami and Shumyatsky noticed that perhaps the very notion of conciseness of group words could be relaxed when we talk about profinite groups. Um, in that paper, they consider the following problem. So you consider W a group word, G a profinite group, and you assume no longer that the set of W values is finite, but instead you assume that it can be infinite, but countable. Uh, they actually conjectured that the verbal subgroup obtained in this way should be finite. And they were able to answer the, the question in the affirmative for three cases. So, or rather, this generalization proved to be hard, proved to be a tough problem. And they considered um, three kinds of words, so squares, commutators between x squared and y, or the well-known and well-behaved multilinear commutators. And on the three cases, they proved that under this weaker assumption here, W of G is finite. And um, some years later, this, this idea of relaxing the, the definition of conciseness was extended to its actual form, um, the form that I, that I studied at the beginning of my PhD. And it's the form I present here to you. So they relaxed a little bit more the, the, the definition of conciseness. I mean, a little bit more, but well, let's not talk about um, continuum hypothesis or, or things like that here. But the definition is the following. If you consider W to be any group word and G is a profinite group, we are going to say that W is strongly concise if this bound so the cardinality of set of W values being not greater than continuum already implies that W of G is finite. And also we say that W is strongly concise in a class C of profinite groups. If for every member of the class such that this bound is attained for uh, some word, this implies that W of G is finite. There are some nice things here involving uh, precisely the paper where they, they define this notion of strong conciseness. One of them that I like is that they avoid at all costs and they are able to do it. Um, they avoid continuum hypothesis. So there's no assumption that um, this cardinality is actually countable anywhere. And it's, it's good, it's elegant. Uh, so as an example, we prove um, very quick, quickly that all words are concise in the class of a billion for finite groups as an illustration of this definition. So consider G to be any abelian profinite group. In abelian profinite groups, well, it's abelian. So if you consider any word, the word reduces to products of powers, right? So it's enough to consider power words. And I won't consider products, just powers. There's a natural way to extend um, conciseness from one word to products of words and independent variables, products. Uh, okay. So we consider that W of X equals X to the N, where N is any natural number. And for these, of course, the, the subgroup, the verbal subgroup will coincide with the set of W values, right? Since um, the map taking G to G to the N is a homomorphism here. In this sense, the verbal subgroup will be either finite or will have cardinality at least the continuum. 
So if you assume the word to have cardinality not greater than continuum, then th this guy should be finite, right? It's an illustration of the definition. Uh, and it's a recent paper. It was published last year. The definition is due to Elizabeth Tommy, Benjamin Klopsch, and Pavel Schmiatsky. And it also deserves the name uh, of strong consciousness, right? Since you relaxed the hypothesis and you arrive at the same conclusion um, as people usually do when studying Hall's uh, conciseness problems. In that paper, they proved among, among introducing um, the idea and proving some useful and basic results, they also proved three major um, results. Not only those three are the, they have actually many more results on the paper, but they proved that all multilinear commutator words are strongly concise. They proved that, well, if F is the free group of countable rank, and if W is any member of the, the, the group such that it induces new potency, so F modulo W of F is new potent, then W is strongly concise. Um, examples of those words are X cubed, for example, groups of exponent three are known to be new potent by a result of Levi and von der Weiden. Um, we can extend this guy by independent variables. So this commutator is one of those words. The two angle commutator also implies new potency and groups. And I'm sorry, did someone say something? Say anything? Okay. Um, and finally, we can, for example, extend the square x squared by r independent variables. And this work also implies new potency on the, the free group. Another nice result is that every group word is concise in the class of nupotent profinite groups. Okay, in that paper, they make some conjectures. One of them is that every group word is strongly concise. The others, they are related to techniques involved in improving the first and the last results here. So when they were, and this part is actually important for the, the research problem I talk, we tackled, um, when you consider multilinear commutator words in the setting of this paper, the strategy used by the, the authors to prove that they are strongly concise consisted, among other things, in finding a normal open subgroup of G such that the word W considered is an identity here. So they managed to find um, such subgroup. And using this information and the bound that the set of W values has cardinality no greater than continuum, they are able to prove that the subgroup generated, the, the verbal subgroup W of G is actually generated by finitely many values. And this is an important um, step towards the solution. So here, the solution passes through a finite generation argument. They have to prove that the group is generated by finitely many values of the word, the subgroup, the verbal subgroup. And in the third case, an intricate combinatoric argument um, using um, parametrized words, well, they use that to, after some reductions, prove that when you consider G to be an important group, having a group where it's satisfying the, the strong conciseness hypothesis, then the set of W values is actually finite under this consideration. So once again, the verbal subgroup associated to the word is finitely generated. So this is an important step towards the solution and towards proving that some word would be um, strongly concise. And actually, in general, they suggest in the paper that to prove that a word is strongly concise for some class of groups, one might proceed in two steps. So first of all, you do some effort to prove that the verbal subgroup W of G is actually generated by finitely many W values. And using this extra information, you prove that W of G is fine. And the thing is that this first bullet here contains um, a, a, an essential reduction that when we talk about the ordinary conciseness problems, um, we already have for granted. That is, um, when W of G is generated by finitely many W values, we can always reduce the problem to the case where this guy here, this verbal subgroup is, is a billion, right? By an application of a result um, due to Schuch that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So this first point is justified by this lemma, as I talked now. Um, when G is a profinite group and X is a, an element of G, well, if the conjugacy class 
of x contain less than continuum elements, then it will be it will be finite, right? So, um, in particular, centralizers are open, right? So, in particular, if W is a group word such that um, we have this bound attained by the uh, satisfied by the the cardinality of the set of W values, and W of G is actually generated by finitely many of those, then W of G prime is finite. And we can kill this guy, work mod a little bit, and well, the problem gets much better. Now we have W of G being a abelian um, normal subgroup generated by finitely many elements. So morally, this first bullet allows us to reduce the problem to, well, what the problems about ordinary conciseness are. Discovering whether W values have or do not have torsion. I mean, finite torsion in this in this group. Okay. Um, next, we say that W is a word implying virtual omnipotency. If every finitely generated metabelian group admitting this word as a law has a new potent subgroup of finite index. Some examples are so here I quote a result due to Greenberg, which I will use later. So, angle words X and Y, they are. Um, they imply virtual nilpotency, and actually any soluble group um, generated by finitely many angle elements is actually nilpotent. Um, and some example, some other example is an extension of this first one by putting arbitrary exponents um, on the, the variables. Okay, and I give this definition because other interesting situations happen when we assume that W of G is generated by finitely many W values. So the atomic option Schmiatsky also prove that when W is a word implying virtual nilpotency, so one of those, or a weakly rational word as I defined in the beginning, and G is a profinite group satisfying our usual hypothesis, but um, such that W of G is finitely generated by W values, then they managed to prove that words satisfying those conditions, well, um, then W of G is finite. So it makes sense, and it's also an important step towards, towards proving some word is strongly concise, to consider what happens when W of G is finitely um, generated by values of the word, right? And that's where I arrive in this, in this setting, and that's the work we, we did in some part of last year. So, we try to solve some problems and always assuming that, well, our usual setup is that G will be a profinite group. We'll have this inequality between the cardinality of this involving the cardinality of the set of W values. And we, are, we will assume further that W of G is generated by finitely many W values. Um, then we are going to investigate some words and, and study whether the verbal subgroup generated by them is finite. Um, we succeeded in some cases. So the first case would be um, consider k n and q to be positive integers. Consider v to be this word. So the kth lower central series, the kth lower central word, um, the commutator x one comma x two comma etc comma x k, and we consider that w is one of those words. So see here. So see here. Um, we are doing that angle-like extension and commutators, right? So y and several copies of v to q, where q is any positive integer, or v to q comma several times y, okay? So if g is a profinite group, uh, satisfying our hypothesis, then w of g is finite. Also, there is um, another result. Actually, this here is not, it's a statement, but it's, a, it's an example with sufficient generality to see the ideas, okay? Um, we did this calculation for a somehow wider class of words, but the statement's too technical. And we considered V to be a weakly rational word, and we extended V by another variable several times. In, in this situation with our usual setting, then W of G is fine, okay? Before we embark on the on the proof of this result, um, 
let me give a couple words uh, a couple words about well having worked a little uh, in the past year with ordinary and strong conciseness some some differences appeared um, between when working with, with either case right so i'd like to give a couple words about what is more i mean about some some of those differences okay so here i consider g to be a residually finite group w a group word such that the cardinality of the set of w values is actually finite for the residually finite one and the the other i will consider profinite and it will have this um, this bound related to strong conciseness on the set of W values. Um, what I want to say is that some techniques that we already have for granted when we study conciseness of words in residually finite groups, we do not have them anymore when talking about strong conciseness. For example, one useful technique is to study what happens in the finite quotients of the residually finite guy because we know that the set of W values is finite. If we take one finite quotient, then the set of W values of the finite quotient will be also finite and actually its order will be bounded by M. So a very useful technique is to reduce the problem to the class of finite groups. And uh, you can investigate if you are able to prove that the verbal subgroup of a finite quotient has order bounded by a function of the cardinality of set of values in the word only. And this amounts to an upper bound for the verbal subgroup in the residually finite case. But we do not have control over things that happen in the finite quotients of the profinite group. And in this case, um, reducing things to study finite quotients might not be that fruitful. But um, the atomic option, Shmiatsky, they have some results concerning finite, finite generation in, um, well, they can prove that the verbal subgroup is generated by finitely many W values by looking to its finite quotients in the case the verbal subgroup is pro-P, for example. So something is lost, but not everything is lost. The second point is maybe the most dramatic here, because when we have a finite number of um, W values, we usually we quickly reduce the problem to the, the case where W of G is a billion, right? And in our strong conciseness case, we have a meta problem of proving that the, the verbal subgroup can actually be generated by finitely many of those guys in order to reduce to the case where this um, W of M is a billion. So this maybe is the most dramatic um, difference among, very, uh, among lot, a lot of others. And this third point um, is to illustrate that at the first glance, things that you, that you can easily prove when you work with ordinary conciseness you might think that they are, well, maybe not true or maybe very hard to prove when you pass to the strong conciseness context. But um, this is an example where a very simple principle, um, I mean, where a fact proved using a very simple principle can also be proved in the profinite setting, but we have to use compli more complicated instruments to do so. So recall, if A is a normal abelian subgroup of G, we have this property here. Um, the commutator between A and B ra uh, raised to the power of any, to any power. Um, we can pull this power inside and put it on A, which is the member of the normal abelian subgroup for any B in G and for any integer exponent. Um, so to illustrate this thing that I said before, assume that our word here is the commutator between X and several copies of V, where V is any word. Actually, this was one of the cases we considered, right? Um, but with specific um, words V here. Um, we want to show, for example, that W of G comma A, A, A has finite exponent when A is any V value, okay? Um, since we can assume that this W of G is a billion from, from the beginning, so recall G is the residually finite guy, okay? A simple application of the pigeonhole principle says that we might choose two different exponents, pull powers inside, then the resulting word will be another W value. And if the set of W values is finite, if we consider simply M plus one of those, um, we find the, this kind of equality. So they have torsion. And actually the torsion is bounded, uh, upper bound is bounded from above by M factorial. 
The thing is that we can prove the same result in the profinite setting, uh, but uh, of course, assuming the, that the, the set of W values has cardinality bounded by um, continuum and that the, the verbal subgroup is generated by, by finitely many W values. We can also do this. But instead of using very, very simple principles, we must rely on back category theorem, for example. So good, um, nice result. And I like this illustration. Um, OK. So let's um, give a, a sketch of the proof of our, of our results. Okay. I'm going to prove only the second theorem that I stated. The first one has a similar proof. It has more or less the same spirit but um, it's also rather technical so it's not worth talking separately so let's see what what can we do in this profinite setting okay so first of all some useful things um, consider that w has the following shape we begin with v any word v and we repeat the variable while several times we consider G to be a profinite group in which the cardinality of the set of W values is bounded by is at most is, I'm sorry, less than continuum. And of course, assume that W of G is finitely generated by W values. Well, choose finitely many of them, say a one, a K in G. What we prove is that there exists a finite characteristic subgroup T contained in W of G such that in this quotient, Oh, well, T is characteristic in W of G, right? So normal in G. The elements, the, the inverses of the generators are T1 plus U angle, where this N is the same N here. Um, this will be an, an application of the idea I said before, right? We can we can prove that those long commutators are have torsion. If we choose finitely many V values, we can consider a subgroup of W of G generated by all elements having order at most some, some specified um, torsion. This guy is finite and this will be the, the subgroup that we are looking for. Um, so modulo a finite subgroup, our elements are actually angle, right? And when studying conciseness of words, of course, we know that we can quotient out finite or torsion subgroups um, several times because what we want to do is to prove that those W values, those generators, actually they have torsion, right? So passing to, to, to this quotient, generators, the inverses of generators are actually angle. Um, this second lemma is a um, result that, well, it's a, a criterion for a new potency, right? So if you consider K and N to be positive integers, and if you let V be any word, if G is any profinite group satisfying this law, so this, this long commutator is trivial. This is the same word we are talking about. Um, if H is a subgroup of G generated by finitely many values of this word, then H is no potent. Actually, this is um, a, a particular case of a more general theorem about finite groups. It's actually a new potency criterion that appeared on one of the papers studied while you're doing this project. And the thing here is that when you consider G to be actually finite, um, you can prove that subgroups generated by finitely many W values have new potency class bounded from above by a function depending on this N and the number of generators. Right? There is a more general setting than this one, but this one will suffice for us. Then you take the, you consider, you use the usual um, inverse limit argument, and you conclude that H, of course, here I'm considering the closed subgroup generated by them, you conclude that this guy is new potent. Okay? So um, we were talking about conciseness, but now we're talking about new potency, and the connection will be clear in the next slide. Um, so by, by now, we have the following lemma. Let G be a profinite group, B weakly rational word, and V the commutator between V and Y, um, the angle commutator. Assume that K is a subgroup generated by finitely many values of the word V. Um, there exists a finite normal subgroup T of G such that the image of, of K in the quotient G modulo T is new potent. It's a direct consequence of the, the two previous lemmas, okay? Um, first of all, 
we, we might work on G modulo W of G. Then this identity we will hold in G modulo W of G. And subgroups generated by finitely many uh, V values will be nilpotent. But when we consider this setting, um, since W of G is generated by finitely many W values, we are assuming here that this guy is abelian. So actually those subgroups generated by finitely many w, w values, they are actually soluble, okay? And then we apply lemma one, localize a finite subgroup of W of G such that in this quotient, inverses are angle. Um, and then we, we find that the image of K in this quotient G modulo T is soluble, finitely generated, of course, topologically finitely generated and generated by angle elements. So all of its finite images will be nilpotent of bounded class by a result of Greenberg that I mentioned earlier when talking about words implying virtual nilpotency. And well, as usual, our KT modulo T will be nilpotent. Okay. Um, so we're almost there. Lemma four, uh, it's a, a useful and technical lemma and it's very simple. It says that uh, consider W to be the nth angle word. So x comma y comma y several times. We can rewrite this word conveniently. There exists a group word w depending on n plus one variables. We have n plus one elements here also um, in the inside the commutator, such that w equals w zero w zero um, evaluated on the elements x x conjugated by y until x conjugated by y to the n. As an example, we will rewrite this two angle commutator as well. Commutators can be written as the inverse of the first entry and the first entry conjugated by the second. Um, commutate the inverse of x and y will be um, x inverse conjugated by y times x times, and this guy here, the second commutator, will be x, conjugate, x inverse conjugated by y and x um, conjugated by y squared. So our word we used for rewriting things here should be x2 inverse x1, x2 inverse x3. Because when you replace x1 by x, x2 by x to the i, and x3 by etc., we recover the same word. So it's very useful when you accumulate nice properties on the first entry of the angle commutator here. We can rewrite our word as some word um, where you have conjugates of this x which will be the word having the nice property later. And finally, we also need um, this technical but very useful lemma. Lemma five is actually a profinite version of a discrete version of the same, the same, more or less the same result. Uh, at first, the, the discrete version of this guy here appeared for dealing the problem of studying if words more or less in the, same, in the same shape as the word that I'm talking about here, whether those were concise, concise, ordinarily concise in the class of residually finite groups. So lemma five says the following, let W be an element of the free profinite group of countable ring, of countable ring. Um, we usually consider words to be elements of the, the ordinary discrete group. But in this result here, we need W to be an element of the free profinite group, okay, of countable ring. Let G be a profinite new potent group generated by finitely many elements. And consider that X is the set of all elements having the following form. So W conveniently chosen, finite, uh, the, you take all the generators and you evaluate words as W of A1 to the I, A2 to the I, AK to the I, where the exponents are the same and I is a topological generator of Z hat. I assume further that this set has cardinality at most, at, at, I'm sorry, less than continuum. Then it's possible to prove that every element of X has finite order. Excuse me. Sure. Uh, I have it here. W is W of X1 and so on, and then WK, what is? Oh, oh it's a misprint. Thank you for saying that. This should be XK. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, well, the proof reduces to the, after a short reduction argument, it reduces to 
uh, we are in profinitely potent groups, so it reduces quickly to pro p groups. And in pro p groups, we can do some nice calculations. So it's a way of proving that elements have torsion, but elements have in specific shapes, right? Um, and, and if you can see, the previous lemmas were actually functional um, for, I mean, this lemma five here was our, our guide when studying this problem. But because we have here. Excuse me, where do you use in the lemma five that uh, your group is of countable rank? You mean your profile and group? Uh, I mean, we, we don't need to use it. It's just to allow words to have arbitrarily large um, number of variables. But then you say just uh, can say just infinite rank. Why do you say countable rank? Well, maybe I should have written infinite rank instead of countable. Okay. So, so in principle, it, it is true for uh, for any uh, profinite group of infinite rank. Pre profinite group of infinite rank. Yeah, because all we need here is that words. I mean, this was done in such a way that words can have um, arbitrarily many variables. This was the only thing we needed infinite here. Okay. The only place. Okay. Okay. Um, and well, th this lemma is, is good to work with because when you are considering those conciseness problems, well, there are, there are several techniques already used in the literature to tackle those problems. Some of them rely heavily on combinatorics. Some of them rely heavily on properties of the class of groups you are considering. But this, this one is new. We can look for new potent subgroups of the group we are working with. And looking at those new potent subgroups, if you choose a suitably, a particularly good word W and particularly well chosen element, say one to AK. And if you do this combinatorics right when constructing this, the set of values, the specific values, um, then you can ensure that the, the W values will have torsion. So the novelty in this, this result, I mean, the novelty was when this result first appeared. This is just a profound adaptation, but it's good that you might change the, the where to look and you might look uh, search for new potent subgroups of our guy right um, so the proof of the, the theorem is as follows so let me restate it let n be a non-negative integer let v be a weakly rational word and consider w to be this commutator v comma y several times if G is a profinite group satisfying this hypothesis and such that W of G is generated by finitely many W values, then W of G is fine. So how do we do this? Um, always in the spirit of this lemma five, okay? So you consider any V value, you consider any element of G, and you take the subgroup generated by conjugates A, A to T, A to T to the N. And it's important to recall that this, this set is normal. So it's invariant under conjugation. And A to T, for example, is another V value, okay? Um, one of the results quoted before said that this group should be nilpotent modulo some finite subgroup of W of G. So for some integer C, the subgroup gamma C of K is contained in a finite normal subgroup T of G. So we can pass to this quotient T is finite after all, and without loss of generality, we can assume that this guy here is new potent. Um, that lemma five was, was nice, but we have to know how to rewrite the word properly. So we consider our angle word and rewrite it as the word I gave in the example. So as W zero of X one until Xn plus one, such that W zero V, V to do, V to do uh, to the N would be uh, V comma U comma U several times for any U, okay? And we consider the set X to be W0 um, evaluated in the, in the tuple A to the I, A conjugated by T to the I, and so on until A to the T to the N um, to the power of I, where I is a topological generator of Z hat. Okay. Um, and here is where weakly ration, weak rationality plays its important role. Because when we take this W0 word, 
it actually, when it's applied on elements having this form, we recover elements having this form, a to the i, comma t times, uh, comma t several times. And well, a is weakly rational, i is a topological generator of the, of z hat. So a to the i is again a v value, and this commutator is again in a w value. So see, that's why we, we use that lemma because x is contained in GW, so it has cardinality less than, than continuum. Um, also, those are specifically the generators of a suitably chosen subgroup that now is nilpotent since we killed that subgroup T, and then we can simply apply lemma five and conclude that all W values of G have finite orders. But that's what we needed, right? Since we are working modulo the finite W of G prime, then the theorem follows. And also, um, when we consider the other, the other generalizations of this, this result that we considered in the paper and the first theorem that I mentioned, we work more or less in the same spirit. But the thing here is that to employ this fifth lemma here, um, we naturally need to seek for uh, sufficient criteria, criteria for specific subgroups to be nilpotent, right? So it's very useful, but we still have to solve this problem here. Nilpotent subgroups does not come for free. Okay, so it's very useful, but we have this, um, this step to, to, to take. And depending on the word, you will have to use, of course, different um, nilpotency criteria. Okay, so I think that's all. Thank you all. Okay, let's thank Joan for interesting talk. Uh, session for questions and comments. Anybody has any question or comment? I have a question. Sure. Of course. Um, so I, I'm asking maybe uh, it's easy question. I mean, because I, I don't know, but uh, um, you said that the conjecture of uh, Klopsch to Tommy Shumiatsky, it was, I think, uh, says that every word is uh, strongly concise. Sure. Yes. So, uh, do you mean in every, like, in the class of all groups, or only in the class of profinite groups? Um, it's, it's strong conciseness is a definition we make specifically oh, for for profinite groups oh, in the okay. setting. Okay. Okay. So this okay. should be. Uh, yes, only profinite. Okay. So my question is. Uh, it says that if I uh, remember correctly, it says that whenever uh, the set of uh, values is at most countable, then it generates a finite group, right? Is the set of values has cardinality less than continuum, not at most countable. Oh, okay. So if it has cardinality less than continuum, mm -hmm. uh, then automatically it is finite, right? Yes. And, not, yes. and not, only, not only it is finite, but the group generated is also finite, right? This is what you're mm -hmm. saying. Yes. So, so uh, is this true that uh, whenever, uh, maybe, I mean, maybe it's uh, obvious, but I, I don't see it. Uh, is it true that whenever uh, a set, I mean, whenever the, word values form a, uh, a set with cardinality less than continuum, then, then this set is finite. Maybe that's true. Uh, maybe that's true. Actually, in their paper, they conjecture two, three things. One is the, the strong conciseness conjecture, the, the most important, of course. And the other two were kind of mm, stepping stone towards proving this conjecture. Um, they conjecture that for every um, group for W satisfying this hypothesis here, bound on cardinality, um, there will exist a normal, a normal open subgroup H of G, such that the word you were trying to prove is strongly concise is an identity on that normal open subgroup. Mm -hmm. This is the first conjecture. And the second one is that, oh no, I'm sorry. Those conjectures are not what you're saying. The second conjecture simply says that um, W of G will be finitely generated. So 
maybe um, okay. Uh, but if this conjecture is true, of course, the set of values will be also always finite, right? If the conjecture is true, the, the set yes, of values yes. will be so, finite. So, so I'm asking this because uh, it, if the conjecture is true, then of course, uh, this GW, this GW should be finite as well, no? Yes. Okay, okay. I mean, I was asking if, if you know if this is true, uh, which is should be weaker to say that GW is finite, I guess. Weaker than the conjecture, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I understood the, the question. I mean, uh, uh, you, were, you were asking... The conjecture says that the GW generates a finite uh, a group. Uh -huh. Now, what I'm asking if is if GW is finite. It, this is... Uh, if, if it generates a finite group, then it's finite, of course. Yes. So, so what I'm asking is is weaker than the conjecture. You know what I mean? Okay, okay. Now I get it. It's weaker, mm -hmm. but in yeah. many important cases, it's just equivalent. Ah, it's equivalent. Okay, okay. Sometimes, in, in important cases, it is equivalent. Yeah. But ah, I mean, okay. since we are talking about conjecture, I also have this question. Uh, is there any advances for uh, profinite soluble groups or uh, uh, pro p groups in this conjecture? I worked on, on a related problem for a while. Um, we had some very partial, partial advances, but well, the th theorem not proved yet, at least the case I, I was working with, but Professor Pablo can say, can say more things. What about metabillion meta profinite groups? That's precisely what I was doing, <laughs> and I couldn't I couldn't solve the problem. But Professor Pavel maybe can can say more things about it. The metabillion case is difficult, but what I remember, I think the Tommy and Klops are now writing paper that virtually nil in virtually nilpotent groups, this conjecture is correct. Uh -huh. I mean, the result was that in nilpotent groups, the conjecture is called correct. But uh, virtually nilpotent is already a difficult case. Is they doing this? A metabillion, we don't know. Okay. Maybe later we can investigate things like um, those classical results. Um, for the ordinary conciseness, we have that every nilpotent group, uh, in, in the class of nilpotent groups, every word is concise. So virtually nilpotent also true um, due to Romankov. And virtually nilpotent by a billion, also true. So maybe that's a way of. Yeah, but problem is that here in our problem, we cannot reduce to finitely generated groups. So yes. you cannot even use results on which that's really a very serious obstacle compared to the original problem of Hall, where we could work with finitely generated groups. Here we can, cannot reduce even to finitely generated groups. That's really makes it very, very uh, murky. It's murky. Yes, more difficult and more interesting too. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Well, I, I have another question. Maybe I already asked it some time ago, but I don't remember this. Uh, when you study profinite groups, actually, uh, then not every element of free profinite group, right, is a word of a uh, uh, a, a finite word as you uh, consider, all right? So maybe uh, one can adapt this to profine uh, groups uh, asking, uh, considering uh, the words uh, where you have sequences converging to something rather than just finitely many elements in the word. Finitely many, rather than finitely many letters in the word, you might consider possibly that where you have a sort of sequence converged, conversion to something and ask similar question for these cases. Have you ever thought about this? I once asked the professor about what, what should we do instead of, if we consider instead of words from the, the ordinary free group, if we consider profinite words. Remember professor? And well, may, maybe he is better than me at, at explaining. Actually, Benjamin Klops also asked me this question a few years ago. So I don't know. We don't know yet. 
Yeah, I just ask because it is um, uh, in profiling case it is more uh, well, more natural. Yes. More natural because uh, in this case every word you can consider as uh, as uh, as a limit of some sequence of ordinary words from free group, or, or I mean ordinary elements like, like products, you know. But anyway, uh, yeah, it is something to think. Any anybody else has a question? Well, if not, let's thank speaker again.